questioning where it belongs. The lives that have been lost in northeast Delhi, seen as a dark turn for a secular India. Yogita Limoye with that report from northeast Delhi. Plenty more on the coronavirus, of course, coming later in the program. You are listening to Newsday with Alan Kasuja and Alex Ritson. A very good Monday morning to you. We're back with Newsday next. And looking further ahead at 9.30 GMT, we're Boston calling. Don't touch your face. That's the advice of health officials. But it's a lot easier said than done. I will be more aware of touching my face today. It's a much more flexible way to extinguish that behavior. At 13.30, we ask, why do we get overwhelmed by caring about other people? Things at home got, just got so bad and so sad and upsetting that I got to the point where I just felt like I couldn't give them any love or care. It was just basic needs and you know that you need to keep them alive. But even then I got to the point where I, I just couldn't even brush their teeth. That's all still to come from the BBC World Service. And welcome to Newsday, your morning news for and from Africa and around the world. Alan Kisuj and Alex Ritson with you from the BBC World Service. Today, as the world comes to terms with the coronavirus, President Cyril Ramaphosa has declared a national state of disaster to deal with the outbreak. And we'll hear from a man bringing solar energy solutions to Nigeria, which suffers from regular power shortages. First, this news. BBC News with Fiona MacDonald. The mayors of Los Angeles and New York have ordered restaurants, bars and cafes to shut in an effort to halt the spread of coronavirus. Broadway theatres and cinemas in Hollywood will also be shut. New York's mayor, Bill de Blasio, said he was acting to break the chain of transmission by ending close social interaction. The US Federal Reserve has acted to limit the damage to the global economy caused by the pandemic slashing interest rates by one full percentage point and pumping hundreds of billions of dollars into financial markets. Other central banks, including that of China, have announced emergency measures to ensure liquidity. The first test of a vaccine for coronavirus will start in the American city of Seattle later on Monday. In trials funded by the U.S. government, 35 volunteers will be inoculated, but none will be infected with the virus. Many Europeans are beginning the week at home as governments across the continent have shut down schools and businesses to try to contain the virus. Germany has closed some of its frontiers and French officials say President Emmanuel Macron is considering following the governments of Italy and Spain by ordering people to stay at home. With at least 26 countries in Africa now reporting coronavirus infections, strict measures are coming into effect in various nations there. Schools in Kenya remain closed and foreigners without a residence permit travelling from a virus-affected country won't be allowed to enter. South Africa has declared a state of disaster and is closing its borders and schools. Some other news. The front-runner for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination, Joe Biden, has said he will pick a woman to be his vice presidential running mate. In a debate with his main rival, Bernie Sanders, Mr Biden also committed to choosing a cabinet which reflected the United States. BBC News. Thank you, Fiona. Hello and welcome to Newsday from the BBC World Service. Alan Kasuja and Alex Ritson with you. Good to have you with us and thank you very much wherever you've joined us from. The latest on the spread of coronavirus, we'll be hearing what Sir Ramaphosa, the President of South Africa, has declared. They're calling it a national disaster. What does it mean? And for the country to successfully combat the disease. And a positive story from Nigeria where an entrepreneur aims to tackle the country's power our supply problems with solar power. In South Africa this morning, President Cyril Ramaphosa, as you heard in the news, has declared a national state of disaster to deal with the coronavirus outbreak. Now, the disease has continued to spread um, in the continent, with South Africa now dealing with 51 cases, which is uh, the, and the threat 
of a serious economic downturn. We're joined now by Laila Majet, who's a journalist and editor at Power 98.7, and that's a talk radio station in Hauteng. Good to have you, and a very good morning to you, Laila. What sort of conversations are taking place in, uh, on your radio show this morning? So it's all about coronavirus this morning, and we're touching on that very thing that you spoke about. You know, what does it mean when our government says we've declared a national state of disaster? And essentially, uh, you know, it speaks to what sort of powers they can now access and accessing resources, any available resources of the national government, including equipment, vehicles and facilities to deal with the outbreak, um, setting up temporary accommodation if necessary, providing temporary emergency accommodation as well. So those are just some of the things that we're talking about this morning. And what are the concerns that uh, the public is expressing, the callers and the people you're interacting with? I think one of the biggest concerns currently is that majority of South Africans live in abject poverty. So if you're telling people to self-quarantine, what does that look like for people who are living I really poverty? like that you're having that conversation. I really hate the phrase self-isolate. What does it mean? And, and, and so you can't force people to self isolate quarantine so it's a really difficult thing and there's no way of monitoring it so we are having those difficult conversations and that's something our government is going to have to look into and there are people who actually make a living on a daily basis you have to wonder and you talk about people living in poverty in south africa how their lives are going to be affected Already we're seeing businesses, especially small businesses, being affected. Between load shedding and now the coronavirus, there's a lot less business happening. People are deciding to um, cancel events. They're not going to buy things and spend money on services that they wouldn't ordinarily have spent on. So the impact is being felt already. And then there are minibuses, trains that people would be normally using on their commutes. Um, everybody seems to be... Oh, it's going to be impacted by all this, don't you think? Absolutely. Um, so we, we're just going our journalists to those taxi ranks today to see and get the feel of what people are feeling because, you know, this announcement came last night of government um, announcing all these measures. But at taxi ranks, which is where the majority of people commute from, what does that look like for them? How are they stepping up hygiene control measures in those spaces? Because there are thousands of people who move through there every single day. In many African countries, people are that one illness away from, you know, losing from losing from poverty. You know, I wonder what the situation is like in um, South Africa. Is it, uh, are people clearer about what help is available to them, where they should go, and whether or not the country is ready for a pandemic for an Italy situation? Yeah, I think our government has done very well in keeping communication lines open. They've set up things like a WhatsApp group where you can easily access information about the virus. They've translated um, sort of info pamphlets um, in all our 11 languages, which they are disseminating to um, our residents. And, and that includes in the more remote rural areas because you know, it's easy for us in the middle sort of sub-economic areas to access this information online. The people in rural areas don't have that sort of access. So government has, you know, done really well in, in getting moving oh. to inform their residents or citizens of what's happening. They've done, just yesterday, um, they visited several churches in rural areas because that's where the majority of people are. Um, to inform them about the virus, what measures they need to take to protect themselves and also what resources government has made available to keep them safe. And just to be clear, 61 people are known, or there are 61 known cases in South Africa, right? And just last night, our president announced that it was the first, we've now got our first local transmission case, which we hadn't had. We've, got, we've gone from one case to 61 cases in 10 days. We haven't had any deaths reported. Um, and so just in that respect, I think our government has been good in tracing contacts quite quickly. And from the people who've arrived back in the country, yeah. um, this has been a very short period between when they arrived and when they've confirmed positive for the virus. It's really good to talk that's, to you. That's good. And thank yeah. you very much for your time today, uh, uh, Lila Majet, a journalist and editor at Power 98.7 FM. And uh, thank you very much if you're listening to us um, in South Africa. That radio station, by the way, is a talk radio station in Hong Kong. <laughs>
recording of cases of coronavirus across Africa has prompted many countries to announce measures to control the disease. Ghana is the latest nation to ban entry to foreign visitors from countries badly impacted. Earlier, as you heard, South Africa declared a state of disaster closing its borders and schools. Kenya has also imposed sweeping travel restrictions. The virus is now confirmed to be present in at least 26 nations across the continent. Earlier, I spoke to Dr. Ahmed Kalabi, the chief consultant pathologist and group CEO of Lancet Group of Laboratories in East Africa. I spoke to him on the line from Kenya. In Kenya, we have had uh, the first case on Friday and then two cases confirmed by the president yesterday. I think I'm very concerned that there must be more cases in the community out there because uh, this particular lady uh, who reported herself to the authorities uh, has interacted with so many people and we know from scientific evidence when one case is picked, usually there will be about 10 others out there in the community. So we definitely are looking at more cases within Kenya. In, in Rwanda, we have had only one case over the weekend and uh, obviously they should be expecting more. Uganda and Tanzania haven't reported any new cases, uh, or rather no cases at all, but they definitely should be worried. And I think the rest of Africa, other than the 26 countries, we are probably looking at cases that are out there in the community not identified yet. Yeah. Dr. Kalebi, how challenging is the coronavirus going to be for African countries? I think if you look at what's happening around the world, for example in Iran, look at what's happening in Italy, I think it's going to be really, really challenging because we don't have any systems in place uh, to, to, to handle this kind of disaster. I mean, I I Italy, Iran, which are much better equipped uh, uh, in terms of hospital uh, capacity, ICU, are suffering as much as we are seeing. If this came into Africa and we had community spread to the extent of the outbreak like in other, other countries, then it would be devastating because, uh, for example, if you look at a country like Uganda, they have less than 100 ICU beds. If you look at Kenya, we have less than 0.01 percent of uh, 0.01 number of ICU beds per 100,000, which is very, very low. So I think uh, the only way to handle this is a complete and uh, drastic uh, lockdown across all the countries because we definitely don't have capacity to handle this kind of an outbreak. You visited Rwanda last week, one of the countries that has closed schools. Is this, is this a good move? Is this the right thing to do? Absolutely, yes, because uh, schools are an incubating uh, area for spread of infection and children can be easy super spreaders. And we now know that uh, coronavirus, other than droplet infection, can also be found in stools, particularly in children, which means you can have fecal oral spread. And you know, a lot of the diseases that can be spread, can be spread fecal orally, for example, cholera and the rest, when we have an outbreak in Africa, is usually quite devastating. So what Rwanda has done, which Kenya has followed suit, closing schools, reducing movement of people, uh, because other than the children going to schools, we have teachers, we have parents moving all over the place. So cutting down the number of people going to schools also makes sure that there's that social distancing and restriction of movement. And what Rwanda is doing is quite beautiful. I was there. They had this experience from Ebola, whereby because of the Ebola scare in DRC, you find most of the businesses, most of the public transport, everywhere they had hand sanitizers. People are trained to wash their hands. Uh, people are trained to be very careful how they cough. In fact, in Rwanda, people don't treat each other on their hands. That's, that was the norm from the, the Ebola scare. And that is now being extended because of the coronavirus. In fact, even before the COVID-19 uh, was announced, they were already having these measures. And I think they'll be very, very successful to contain the virus. We do have prime ministers, presidents, health ministers from across the African continent listening to this program. If you could give them one piece of advice, what would it be? We need to do everything to flatten the curve. There is no way the virus is going to disappear. But what you really want to have is the spread. It should be more contained. In other words, it's going slowly in the community rather than having an eruption. And I was speaking there with Dr. Ahmed Kalabi, Chief Consultant, Pathologist and Group Chief Executive of Lancet Group of Laboratories East Africa. And this is Newsday from the BBC, our top story. Uh, New York and Los Angeles have joined Paris and Berlin in closing bars and restaurants, cinemas and theatres as governments around the world um, introduce increasingly restrictive measures to try to hold the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. The United States um, Central Bank has slashed interest rates to virtually zero to limit the economic fallout of the disease. And also the first trials of a vaccine for the virus will begin in the U.S. Uh,
Ross has the latest on coronavirus transport. Oh, you are not kidding, are you? We're going to start in Europe, of course, one of the worst affected areas at the moment, where the president of the Italian Football Federation, Gabriele Gravina, has called for a postponement of the European Championships, Euro 2020, in order to allow for Serie A to complete its domestic league season. All club football in Italy, of course, and every other major European country stopped as a result of the coronavirus outbreak. European football's governing body is holding an emergency meeting on Tuesday. Meanwhile, former Manchester City defender Alekhi Mangala and the Argentina international Ezequiel Garay are among five staff members and players at the Spanish club Valencia who've been diagnosed with the virus. The president of the Swiss FA, Dominique Blanc, also tested positive. Ghana, Brazil and Mexico have become the latest countries to suspend their domestic leagues. Brazil suspension came hours after Grêmio players emerged from the tunnel wearing protective masks in protest of being made to play. Former Manchester United and England captain Wayne Rooney has said players have been treated like guinea pigs by the UK government and football authorities during this outbreak as his Derby County side and others were still playing after other English sports had shut down. Former Everton and Scotland player Pat Nevin does not agree. No, I don't agree with most of it, to be fair. Mostly because if you football is up in that area, so have a look around the rest of the country. Everyone else is going to work. Everyone else has been going with it. Everyone else is having to cope with it until the government makes decisions. Remember, part of the time you're expecting to react to what the specialists and the experts said. Football stopped before it was suggested that it should stop. And the Olympic boxing qualifiers in London are going to continue, but spectators aren't going to be allowed in from today. Right, enough about the coronavirus. Let's talk about some actual sport. Makata Semenya says she is confident of being able to make the qualifying time for the Olympic 200 metres, having announced over the weekend she is switching to that distance. The two-time Olympic 800 metre champion cannot compete in events between 400 metres and a mile without taking testosterone reduced drugs because of a change in the rules of world athletics. Well, in Pretoria on Friday, the South African ran the shorter distance in 23.49 seconds. That is still 0.69 seconds outside Olympic qualifying time. Yeah, it's doable, man. Uh, like I said, this thing, you know, they're more technical. Uh, if you work on your biomechanics, you work on your recovery on your legs, especially when you're running, you work on the band, which is um, we only had like three weeks of doing that. Uh, the times are we chopping them a bit. It's possible, man. NFL players have agreed a new collective bargaining agreement which will see sides play an extra game every regular season and see the playoffs expand to 14 teams also being widely reported in the US the plans to push back the end of the league year from this Wednesday have been scrapped that means that is the date when free agency will begin and Judd Trump has become the first ever snooker player to win six ranking title titles in a single season he's been Kyron Wilson behind closed doors in the final of the Gibraltar Open and also becomes the world number one overtaking Neil Robertson who had to withdraw with illness. California native Tiffany Carruthers always adored surfing and wanted to inspire people as she travelled but her biggest challenge occurred when arriving in Sri Lanka, encouraging women and girls to join in riding the waves, breaking cultural norms that were set in place there. She eventually set up the Arugam Girls Surfing Club, teaching and training local women to be surfers and coaches. She told me her story. It really began um, just in the beginning days in 2011, getting the girls out in the water and, and just being able to get a couple of girls to be able to come out. And then um, other girls saw that they were surfing and kind of got permission from the parents and brothers and uh, got some other girls surfing. And when they saw that other girls were surfing, they also joined in. And, and that's kind of where it began. And when the girls joined together, they kind of just said, you know, we're going to do this. So you set out to fight stereotypes and to teach people. What's it been like? It hasn't been easy, but the girls have been so strong and been a you know huge, huge part of breaking that because we had so many obstacles to jump through and have been told to stop and my family was threatened and just saying that we were 
trying to change the culture and well, who's threatened and why, why, why don't they like it a lot of the men in the village didn't like it the tourist board originally thought it was a bad idea the nice thing now is that they're changing their minds and they're seeing that this is a positive thing and that these women can help the economy and even by becoming surf instructors other women would like to um, have women surf instructors so they see that this is a positive thing and you managed to get the attention of the, the surfing legend tim jones Yes, Tim Jones has been awesome. He's been a huge support for me. And even the times when I felt like I, you know, my family was being threatened that if they saw me pushing the girls into waves that we would need to leave the country. And Tim Jones was um, very instrumental that time and just said, Tiffany, keep keep doing it. You know, we, we want to see the girls surfing and just encouraged me along along with ISA and Red Bull and so we kept doing it and and finally those people you know they came along and they could see that this was a positive change. Last question tell me what the surfing is like in Sri Lanka and just take me inside what's going through your head when you're riding one of those waves? Oh, it's just like freedom and just being free and out in the ocean is such a good feeling and it's just beautiful. It's paradise here, you know, and, and you're riding that wave and just looking around and the beauty that surrounds you here in Sri Lanka, it, it's just an amazing feeling. And I'm so stoked that these girls also get to have that feeling now. And I was speaking there to a California surfer who had set up shop in Sri Lanka. Nigeria is facing an energy crisis where the country often runs into blackouts and that take a long time to fix. Many people are forced to use diesel generators to provide electricity to their homes and businesses, which um, release toxic fumes. Well, one man um, is on a mission to change that and is now at the forefront of providing solar power systems to several people throughout Nigeria. Ademola Adeshina joins us now. Good to have you on Newsday. Um, Hi, good morning, sir. So thank you very much for your time. Just tell us a little bit about the sort of um, solar solutions you're offering at the moment. Uh, so Rensource, at Rensource, we build what are essentially large microgrids, but instead of their, the typical use case in, in rural communities, we, we focus on these large urban markets that Nigeria and quite a lot of Africa have a lot of. So we end up becoming essentially the primary power provider to these large markets. And these markets can have anywhere from you know a few hundred shop owners to tens of thousands, 20, 30,000 shops. Uh -huh. and, and, t and today they're just running completely off of diesel uh, generators. And where each individual shop owner has a very small. So, what are you very offering? Expensive. Tell me about your solutions. What are you giving them? So, we essentially blanket the rooftops of the entire market with solar panels, put uh, the right power equipment um, throughout the market, and then put a very, a very smart metering device in each of their shops mm -hmm. and, and offer them solar power. So, we offer them a way to pay for power. And, and what, what can the solar power do? Because in many cases, a lot of the solar. Um, solutions tend to just, you know, charge the phone and off our light. Nothing, nothing, nothing serious. No, so this can do everything. This can do much more. So this can be as basic as just, um, you know, powering their lights and fans. But depending on the quantum of power they want, this can go as far as powering the refrigeration, uh, powering irons and, and really? Powering devices. irons. Irons are notoriously yes. difficult. You're actually exactly right. In, in, in Lagos, where we have one of our, our markets, um, you know, most of the traders in one market, in the Ikwari markets, um, are actually, um, 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 they, they sell textiles and they offer ironing services. And in that market, we actually have to procure a special device yeah. um, that allows um, our kind of uh, solar to, to power their irons. That's quite so impressive. The most so you must, have, you, you, must have, you must have quite a lot of customers then. Nigeria, every Nigerian wants a permanent solution to their electricity problem. They certainly, everyone does. Um, right now, we're rather focused on this niche use case of these large urban markets. Okay. But even in that in that use case, uh, you know, we're currently active in seven markets across five states in Nigeria, uh, where across all those markets are about 50,000 merchants. So what about the provide. cost element? How much does it cost to set up? So, um, you know, it, there is no cost to the merchants um, to, to start using our power and, um, to connect. So how do you um, make more... Money? Uh, what, 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 when they actually, so, so they don't pay us um, to buy equipment, they pay for a service. So there's no upfront cost, then of course they pay for the energy. So you need to recoup because surely your investment is heavy in setting up.